<laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Well, good morning and welcome to uh, those folks that are joining us online. It's been a, a, a unique, I guess, experience for me and for us who, you know, did online services, but not exclusively. And uh, so the first few weeks was really experimental, um, you know, by fire. And I realized that, you know, when you don't have anybody in the auditorium, you still think you do. And you're panning the building while you're looking at a camera and realize no one's here. And so I had to just stay focused on a camera. And that was very unique. How many of you, when you talk to somebody, you actually look at them in their eyes the entire time? That's not easy to do. And uh, so I had to keep, I wanted to look and I had to keep telling myself in the middle of my message, stay focused. I wanted to turn my head, you know, but it was, it was different, but uh, it's been interesting. We've had a, a fun time doing it again without Ryan and some of the folks in here doing it. It would have been very difficult for us to do, but I do welcome those that are joining us online. Thank you for being with us. We're glad that you're here today. Um, do you realize the last time we were together in this church building was March 15th? It just doesn't seem possible that when we were planning in January our year for 2020, that we could have possibly anticipated that we were going to be not in this building for almost three months when we were planning out our year. That part of that plan um, did not include a worldwide pandemic and uh, not being together. You know, and I hope that really through this disruption, that we all have a deeper appreciation of our church family. We all have a deeper appreciation of just the freedom that we have here in our country to be able to get together. That's right. um, and I want to encourage you to realize in the midst of some of the negative that we're dealing with right now, I've been kind of following events around the world. And there are, there are literally countries and cities right now around the world that people are starving um, they, the one city, there were a number of people that died just because people were delivering food to the city and people were trampled to death trying to get food um, because of this pandemic and because of people being locked into their houses. And some of those countries don't care about the people. They just close everybody up in their house and whatever you have in your house is what you can survive off of. Um, so I just, I just want to encourage us to realize how blessed we are. Do you realize how blessed we are? We really are that we can get out of our house, go to the grocery store and, and get our food that we need and, and all of those things. And we are very, very privileged people. Um, God has been good to us. Has he? God has been good to us. So keep, keep those other places uh, in the country in prayer because it's obviously been a challenge for many, many people around the world. Um, even though some of our church family is not with us in this building, we have our church family out there that is wa are watching. And uh, when they feel comfortable coming back and it's safer for them to be able to do that and more prudent for them, obviously they will be here. But it's so great to see you. Look at each other. Look at each other and just tell them you look great. Yeah, you just, you just look awesome. Um, oh, by the way, if you, if you did not hear Pastor Joshua and Andrea had their baby boy on Tuesday... Uh, and uh, he's not really a little boy. He was 10 pounds. <clears throat> so he's like already got facial hair. You can't see it. And I think he's got six or eight teeth. Um, trust me, Andrea realizes he's got teeth. Right now, no. But no, he's a cute little guy. They're doing great. They went home, I think it was uh, Wednesday or Thursday morning, and they're at home today enjoying the new addition to their family, uh, the two little boys are just loving him to death, and um, they're just having a great time. His folks are out here with them too, so they're all at home watching this morning and um, enjoying being home together as a family. Well, for those of you that did not know or maybe didn't realize, today is Pentecost Sunday. <clears throat> um, it is the day recognized by Christians all over the world as the birth of the New Covenant or the New Testament church. 
as we know it. The word Pentecost designates the 50th day after Passover or the 50th day after Easter, which was to the Jews, it was a feast day, also known as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. And we have something we're going to be doing next week that I'm going to uh, let everybody know of through the week that'll be kind of fun just as a way of saying thank you to God for us being together, for helping us as a church in the midst of this challenge that we have faced that we'll all as a church family be able to participate in next week. Um, But I'll tell you about that um, as the week goes on. Um, It was on this day 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 followers of Christ who gathered together in the city of Jerusalem. When I decided what was unique, when I decided to, uh, the date that we were going to regather our church family in this building, I didn't realize that it was Pentecost Sunday. Um, And then as we began to make plans for it, because I always felt like even in the midst of this, that we were going to be back together before the 1st of June. One way or another, we were going to be together. And uh, so we picked this date, and then I realized there was a bunch of other churches that actually picked it because it was Pentecost Sunday. And I don't think, and I don't look at this situation of people gathering together um, on this day as a coincidence. I believe that God has something in mind in all of this. I looked at this day as an important moment for us as a church. A significant moment for us as a church, just like for those early disciples. Think about it. They had their lives disrupted when Jesus Christ was crucified and died. Then He rose from the dead. He appeared to them and He encouraged them after being with them for 40 days before His ascension to heaven. He then told them to wait in Jerusalem. And Acts chapter 1 tells us that. Luke chapter 24 He told them to wait until they were endued with power from on high, until the Holy Spirit was released upon them and into them and onto the earth. Prior to this moment in time, the Holy Spirit had not been released on the earth as the presence of God in the lives of human beings. He anointed people, but not every single person had the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit living in them and upon them like we do today. We live in an entirely different dispensation of God upon the earth right now. Our our founding fathers, our founding families, the, the women and the men that came before us in the faith did not get to experience what we get to experience. The people of, in Abraham's day, in the days of David, in the days of the kings of, of of Israel upon the earth. They did not get to experience what we get to experience. We have the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Isn't that incredible? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, Jesus promised them, He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Do you realize that that is not changed? That has not changed for us. And there are some unique similarities. When I got to thinking about this, there are some unique similarities between those people and even us today. They had been waiting for the next phase of their lives and for their ministry. They were facing the unknown and all the things that come with that unknown, including fear. When Jesus left and went to heaven and told them to wait, they wondered what was going on. They didn't know all of the timing in it. They didn't know what was going to happen. But they had anticipation. They were looking at a totally new paradigm shift of life and ministry. They knew things were going to change. They didn't know how it was going to change, but they knew things were going to change. Change had not occurred for hundreds and hundreds of years. They had done the same thing every year, every week for hundreds of years. In one flash, in one moment, everything changed. They had been dealing with a life disruption, looking at what was going to become a new normal for them. But in the midst of that, in the midst of even that uncertainty, there was an obvious excitement of what God was going to do through them. And I look at the same thing. I look at you and I having an opportunity 
to experience something new that no one else has gotten to experience. See, I don't know about you, how many of you grew up um, in a Christian home who grew up in a church going to church most of your life? How many of you did that? Some of our young, young folks did in here. I did. I had a privilege of growing up in a Christian home. My dad was, and mom and dad were very instrumental in the starting churches. And um, my dad would always tell you the first day we walked into this church in Monta Vista, Colorado, the attendance doubled because of the size of our family. And, uh, but my dad, was, my mom and dad were very actively involved in Sunday services. My mom played the piano. My dad was a singer. My mom was a singer. Um, my dad was a chairman of the deacon board. And I say all that because growing up in the church, we were, we were always there, just like many of our families are. I grew up there. I spent my childhood there, helped build the church with an architect. I was involved in all of those things. And in, in the 58 years that I've been on this earth, and probably, you know, the four when you're young don't remember, but for at least 50-something years, I have never seen anything like this. I have never in my entire life seen where a church could not meet because of something going on like this. I mean, there were times when I was a kid, we'd have a snowstorm, and we'd get the, call, the phone call, well, we're not having church today because we can't get out of our driveway. You know, stuff like that. But I've never seen anything like this. This is something new. Our young people, our, you and I will have something to, to look back as as a memorial marker of something that happened. You look at our seniors that graduate from college. My son did, my daughter. Many of you have graduates. Um, they didn't get their graduation. They, this would be a memorable moment for them. See, but in this memorable moment, they, we want them to remember what God has done. We want them to remember what God did, not just what happened in this world, but how God came through, what God did in our lives, what God did in this place. What we need today, just like those early followers of Christ, is another outpouring of the Holy Spirit's power on Christian people for our day. We need a fresh visitation of God upon our lives, upon our homes, upon our communities, upon our leaders, our pastors, those spiritual representatives that we can join together as one voice and impact this world in the same way those 120 people did in Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. See, when Jesus was saying, what Jesus was saying to them, listen, what Jesus was saying to these early disciples when he told them to wait, when he told them to stay put, you know, it was interesting. They were following their governing authority when he told them to stay put. Interesting. They were following their authority that said stay put. We have to follow our authority and do the best that we can to submit to those. As long as it's not penetrating and coming against our Christian faith that God has given us. But interestingly enough, what was Jesus saying to them? Think about this. When Jesus was saying to them, you stay right here because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. How many of you have ever heard that statement before the best is yet to come? You know, I know many of us because of our current circumstance would rather hear the words, the best is now to come. But the word yet implies something in the future, a point in time. But when is the question. Today, next week, next month, we know this. The best is coming. I'm sure many of us would rather like to know when we could expect it to actually be here. Would be nice to know. If I was able to tell you when that, when that was going to happen, you wouldn't need faith. But that's what faith is. But I heard many, many weeks ago when we were deciding to get back together, this is the words that God put into my spirit. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. We know as followers of Christ that no matter what happens in this world, eternity is going to be far better than this. But that's not what we're talking about. In a true sense, yes, eternity is the best that is yet to come, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this life in the here and the now, the one we are living in right now. The Apostle Paul gives us some very, a very powerful promise about this in his letter to the Galatians in chapter 6 
in verse 7 and 9. This, this may be a familiar passage to some of you that have been in the Christian faith for a while, but for those of you that have not, this is a very well-known passage of Scripture that is used in many different cases and different scenarios. And the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but from the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. You know, I don't know about you, but I've heard so many times the negative side of this. You're going to reap what you sow. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of excited about reaping what I've sown. Because you know when you've sown good things and you haven't seen those good things rise to the surface yet, that there is an expected time in the future when that is going to happen. And it's not going to happen when I die. It's going to happen while I live. The Apostle Paul is giving us a promise. And if the only thing that we're concerned with is related to our material wants and desires then that is what you'll get. He's not saying you're not going to get that. Listen to this. He is saying that if you you are focusing on material desires and you're, you're sowing something to reap that, you're going to get that because that's the law of sowing and reaping. He says you're going to get that. He says, but if you will focus on what the Spirit wants and is trying to do in and through your life, you will get both. You'll not only get your hopes, dreams, and desires through it, but you will get the spiritual result of the same action also. So if you put your priority on what the Spirit of God wants, God is going to give you the other. The word here, when you look at this word and you check it out, the word eternal life that he promised, he said you'll reap reap eternal life. That word means both the present and the future. It's not just future, it also means the present and the future. It would definitely be easier in our Christian walk if we knew when the, best, the, when the blessings were scheduled to show up. For those of you A personality type people that live by a schedule and have to have everything decently and in order, it would be fun for you to be able to put this on your calendar, wouldn't it? That July 17th, my blessing is hitting. Yeah, exactly. But that isn't, that isn't the way things work, is it? But yet, listen, yet requires us to shift our focus from what God can give to us, instead occupy our time with what God can do through us to reach other people while we wait for the other. See, God wants to use you. It's an act of faith when we say the best is yet to come. When we say the best is yet to come, it's an act of faith. But our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is in God. Think about it. The early disciples right there in the book of Acts, when Jesus told them to wait, when he says, I want you guys to wait here until the power of God comes upon you. And what did they say immediately? They were into the natural answer also. They immediately said, is it this time that you're going to restore the kingdom? In other words, they wanted to know, okay, is this when I get to sit on my throne next to you? And Jesus is like, dude, guys, focus on the future. Let's look at the eternal benefits of what, God, what is going to happen here. Let's stop thinking about yourself. See, when we do that, God works through us. The Bible tells us that in Isaiah 41, 13, I love this verse, He said, I am the Lord your God. I am holding your hands, so do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am here to help you. you, Fear cripples us, but faith supports us. Faith in God is like somebody holding your hand when you're unsteady. Jesus is holding your hand. When I thought of this, I thought of the number of times when I was a kid. When I was little, and I remember holding somebody's hand. Holding my parents' hands, holding my dad, holding my mom as we're walking. And did you know, when someone was holding my hand, I was never afraid that I was ever going to fall. 
That's what God wants us to know today. For each and you, each and every one of you individually, God is holding your hand so you will not fall. I can say, listen, I can say and believe the best is yet to come because I'm rooted in a positive past experience. In other words, I know what God has done so I can be fueled for the future. I don't need to see or understand it because I know what God has done in the past and I'm ready for what God is going to do in the future. See, the question we have to ask ourselves is today is, are you rooted in God's faithfulness and confident that He will lead you and I into the future, even if the future looks different than we thought? But we can be confident because we know what God has done. Just like the first century disciples, they did not know what tomorrow would look like. They just knew the best was yet to come based on the promises that Jesus had made to them, and they were fueled for the future. They were ready to see it happen, and they were waiting with expectation of what God was going to do. Listen, while the gospel is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the methods we use to communicate and spread the gospel are constantly changing. But in our case, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I want you to think about what would have happened if we would have been in this same situation 20 years ago. 20 years ago, or a little bit more, we would not have had the technology to be able to do live streaming. We, our school would not have had the technology to be able to do online classes with kids, to be able to communicate. Aren't you glad for the internet? I am glad for technology. That kept us moving forward. I don't know what churches would have done 25 years ago if they would have not had the ability to communicate the way we have been able to communicate today. So let's jump back to the first century here real quick. So here's the disciples 50 days later after Jesus was taken to heaven. They're all gathered together in one place. They're waiting. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them and changes their lives literally in a blaze of glory, in a flash. And not only them, but it changed all the people who were gathered in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit had changed their life. So when God changes your life, He changes other people's lives. What they considered to be normal was no longer normal. But here's the question. After they experienced what they just experienced, do you think they wanted to go back to what was normal? No. These people's lives had been in the process of disruption for months. The process of change was going on in their lives since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were in a disruption and a change when Jesus rose from the dead and left, went back to heaven and left them there waiting. They were ready to walk into a new normal, and little did they, know, did they know that the new normal was going to be better than the old. When we trust God, the new is always better than the old. God makes sure of it. In similar fashion to the early disciples, our lives, as we know that have been in the process of change during this whole disruption, during the, all this, this pandemic, many people just want to go back to normal. Well, I'm not sure I want to go back to what was normal. I want to see God do something new. How about you? What an opportunity to see God do something new. Today is the day of Pentecost. It's a day of new beginnings. And I believe for us and for you, the best is yet to come. This situation that we find ourselves in doesn't limit what God can do in our lives. It forces us to think differently. Our mission, our message as a church and as individuals hasn't changed. The method of how we carry out that, that mission has changed. And it will continue to change. Will we get back to normal, whatever that is? I don't know. Of course we want our, our families back together. We want to be able to do our children's churches. We want to be able to do our youth group. We want our school to be back in a classroom doing what it's supposed to do. Those things we want because I believe those are necessary. But the other ways we communicate, how we can utilize technology, things we can do to reach out and, and reach people better, we don't want to change. We want to keep moving forward. 
Because we've had a lot of positive changes that happen. We talked about with our online service and all of that. Those are some positive, very positive things that have happened. In the midst of this, I don't know about you, but I've not had all the answers that I needed to figure out what was going on. But what I do know is in times like this is where God loves to show up. This is where God's strength gets to show up in our weakness because our faith is in Him and not in ourselves. That's when we can say the best is yet to come. Look at your neighbor and say the best is yet to come. See, God is with us. God is in us. God is for us. We're not created to survive. Listen, we're created to thrive. God wants us to thrive in this. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly unless you're in the middle of a corona crisis. <laughs> Is that what he said? The word of God rises above it. Yeah, do we have to wade through all this? The unpredictable nature of this, can we control that? No, this is not in our world to control. But God is. God is still in charge. How many of you agree with me? Today's a reminder of how powerful the Holy Spirit is and what He can do with a person or a group of people that focus on Him when they find themselves in a place of disruption. In that... I don't know what to do place. How many have ever been in an I don't know what to do place? I've probably prayed that a few times over the last two months. When I look at a situation, I go, I don't know what to do, but. You know, it's interesting. I was reminded of a story, and I'll get through this and come to the end here in a minute. But I was reminded of the story in Second Chronicles about one of the kings of Israel. You know, there are many stories where you find some of our faith patriarchs saying to God, I don't know what to do. Jerry Wainer just shared one of those when David was faced with that situation. He's like, God, I don't know what to do. But, listen to this, I found those exact words. God reminded me of this story. It's the story of King Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament, and he is one of uh, the better kings um, of, the, of the, the kings of, of the people of Israel and um, the Bible even tells us that God was with him. God actually showed favor to him. And you can find his story in the book of, in the book of Chronicles. And I'm going to read right here in chapter 20. I just want to share something with you, what happened in his life. And uh, beginning in chapter 1, the Bible tells us that all of these nations around him all gathered together. And they are coming to fight against the nation of Israel. And you have to understand back in these days when they were going to be attacked by an enemy, it wasn't pretty. They would come in and kill everybody. They would turn people into slaves. They would brutalize them, beat them, starve them to death. This was, this was terrible, terrible stuff. And the Bible tells us right here in this story that as soon as Jehoshaphat heard about it, he was afraid. No kidding. Because he knew what could happen. So he was afraid. He gathered people together. He's like, what do we do? We look here in verse 12. And I love this verse. And here, he, just like us. And here we are. And he says, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we what? Know what to do. But, aren't you glad for the buts in the Bible? He says, but what? Our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. He didn't stop at we don't know what to do. He didn't stop there. He said, but our eyes are upon you. He did not focus on the situation, but on God who is above the situation and on God who delivered them. Listen, you read on the rest of the story, God delivered them without them raising a sword. It's one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. There's a few of them like this, and this is one of those stories where they didn't even have to go out and raise a sword. God actually turned the enemies against each other. And all the people of Israel, of Judah did, they walked out and spent three, day, three days collecting the spoil. When God gives a word, God's going to follow it through. 
We're in a time where we need the power of God in our lives and the power of God in our world to deal with this situation that we are facing. How many of you agree with me that it's bigger than us? We need God to intervene. See, when you face something that is not in your power or your responsibility control, put your eyes on the Lord and trust Him to see you through. Because why? The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Here's the question for all of us. Do you believe that God has the very best planned for you? You have to be convinced of that. This may be a difficult question for us to answer right at this moment. You may be thinking about the current situation that we're in or what this has caused or is going to cause or something completely unrelated to this and you're wondering how anything can change for the better at this point. Well, I want to challenge you to consider the promises of God and His Word and what God is going to do through those. So this morning I'm going to do an exercise Real quick, and I think you, you'll like this. So I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, just maybe one verse. And at the end of that verse, I want you to echo, the best is yet to come. So I will read the verse, and you speak out, the best is yet to come. And see what you feel like when we get to the end here. Okay? Okay. So Psalm 46.1, I'll read the verse and then you say the best is yet to come. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble because... Yes. Jeremiah 29.11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future because... Romans 8.31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things because... Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength because... The best is yet to come. One thing that all of these verses have in common is the requirement of faith. How can you expect the best to come if you don't believe that it ever exists? Living a life without faith is kind of like waiting every day for the mailman to deliver a package that you never took time to order. We have to have faith. We have to have faith in something bigger than us. And that's in our God. I realize the best is yet to come should be more than, just a, and more than just a catchphrase. It really needs to be a battle cry demanding that we extend ourselves beyond the convenient and the comfortable, not only in actions but through words as we affirm and speak into our reality the very best that God has for us that He's already set in motion. How many of you would believe and agree with me that God has set good things in motion for you? But we reach out and grab them through faith in the promises of the Word of God. Let me ask you something. What is this? Wow, you guys are observant. It's a fork. It's a fork. And I'm going to tell you a story as we close this morning about this fork. Why this fork is so important to us today when we think about the best is yet to come. There was an elderly, very committed Christian woman who called her pastor one day to plan her funeral because she knew she's getting very, very old. Sooner or later it was going to happen. She wanted to plan her funeral out. She gave her pastor her funeral plan, included all of her favorite songs, the scripture that she wanted read, and even the people that she wanted to talk. She literally left nothing to chance. Then she went into her kitchen, got up from the table, went into her kitchen, and took out this silver fork and asked the pastor to make sure that she had that silver fork laid in her hand when she was in the casket. And just like you and I, surprised the pastor asked, 
Why of all of the things that you could have with you, you would want to be buried with a fork in your hand? The woman explained, all throughout the years of my life, when I was eating dinner with my family, growing up, when I was eating dinner with my husband, when I was eating dinner with my own children, when I was at church functions, when I was out on a dinner date, when I went to dinner parties with friends, every single time I went, I remembered something. After the meal, a particular time came that I always remembered to keep my fork. And sometimes when the servers would come to clear the plates, I would give them everything, but they would tell me, ma'am, keep your fork. I knew right then they were telling me dessert was going to be served. And when they, and they said to me, keep the fork, they meant the best is yet to come. So she told the pastor, I just want people to see me there in my casket with my shiny fork in my hand, and I want them to know that this fork has always been a reminder to me from the Lord, no matter what I was going through at the time, because he was with me, I could say the best was yet to come. And now she said, as I prepare for my eternal journey, I want everyone to know where I am going. It's the blessed, best place after all to be in the presence of my Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted them to have the same future and enjoy the same faith that I did and the same confidence that I have to know what? The best is yet to come. Listen this morning, and I want to encourage you that in spite of all the difficulties that have engulfed us, engulf literally all of humanity, the very best that God has for us still lies ahead. It's not behind us. It's in front of that. So with all of that said this morning, I just want to encourage every time you see a fork or you hold one in your hand for dinner or breakfast or lunch or eating your dessert, let that fork be a reminder of what? The best is yet to come. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for the reminder that the best is yet to come. I thank you, Lord, that no matter what negative things we have been through, no matter what the enemy has thrown in our path through all of this that we have experienced around the world, the best is yet to come. I thank you, Father, for the hope that you give to us through your word, the hope that we have be, because of our past experience of positive things and seeing what you have done how you have come through for us as a church, how you have come through for us as a nation, how you've come through for us as individuals, that we can put our faith and our hope in you because you're bigger than any problem. And you made a promise that we can do all things through Christ because the best is yet to come. Amen. And so, Father, I thank you for this day, the day of Pentecost. I thank you for the Holy Spirit's power that's in our lives. And if there's anyone in this place today that has never experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life, I ask you, Lord, just by their asking you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, that they can experience something great and something new. And I want to encourage you here today, each and every one of you, if you have never invited the Holy Spirit to be in your life, all you have to do is ask Him. Jesus said, if you will ask for the Holy Spirit, God will give you the Holy Spirit. Because that promise is for you, just like it was for these early disciples 2,000 years ago. That same promise is for you, that if you ask for the Holy Spirit, God will give you the Holy Spirit. So Father, today we just thank you for being together. We thank you for watching over our families. I ask you to protect them, put your healing presence around them. We thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit that no pestilence or disease will come near our dwelling. That's a promise you made, Lord, because we live in the shelter and the secret place of the Most High, and we trust you today, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, and uh, pick up your fork and know the best is yet to come. Also wanted to let you know, those of you who would like to register for next week's service,
Um, you can go online. There's going to be a card right online, sglife.org. They will show you exactly what to do to register. So just gives us an idea of how many people are coming and how we can make car, the spacing appropriately and all that kind of stuff. So God bless you. Thank you again. It's wonderful to see you all. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. And don't forget, go tomorrow to our daily dose for some new news that's coming up. So.